Uh, but we're, we're very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Trevor Kishishian. Uh, Mr. Kishishian is, uh, has a long CV. I'm not going to talk about his past so much. I'll just say that he's a uh, senior VP at Qualcomm, one of the largest uh, IT companies of any kind in the world, and in particular in the semiconductor industry, maybe uh, the or one of the uh, absolute leaders. And so a uh, very fast moving uh, industry as we know. Uh, and, and there's semiconductors everywhere, literally uh, and figuratively. And, and so today, the, the topic we're going to hear about is uh, the industry itself sitting at an inflection point, at an inflection point, uh, like never before. The confluence of AI, machine learning, Internet of Things, connectivity is driving new requirements. And so we're living through a paradigm shift is, is very exciting and it's very... Uh, well, it's fascinating to be in the middle of and to be on the other side of it as it happens. And so the, the automotive industry is what's propelling a lot of these changes. And so we're going to hear about sort of where does the world of automotive and the sort of recent history and, and looking ahead, how that sort of intersects and is intertwined with semiconductors. So the requirements, uh, these requirements are pushing the boundaries of what's possible in leading edge technology process nodes, product quality and cost, and system deployments. In addition, of course, there are security, privacy, and policy issues, and all of these kind of come together to, uh, to affect the semiconductor industry. So that's kind of my uh, paraphrasing of the abstract uh, we received. I'll, and now, and pretty soon, we'll fire up the presentation. But thank you, uh, Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, while we're waiting, I'll do a, how many of you have heard of Qualcomm? OK, quite a few. I actually, I actually the guys who work for synopsis don't count so uh, <laughs> okay and you no, I know but I saw the faces I, I met them last year I met them this morning uh, so uh, what I would like to do is until they, they get the thing ready uh, maybe I'll talk quickly about Qualcomm what we do but also during the presentation just to make it interactive if you guys have questions don't wait till the end just raise your hand and uh, I think it's better that way because I don't have too many slides. Uh, I think it's about 16 or 14, but the PowerPoint is about what 35 megabytes, so it's very heavy content. So, uh, and I tend to go. Uh, I tend to usually I tend to go very fast through the material. That's why you have to stop me if you need me to slow down, explain something a bit more. So, uh, let, let's make it interactive. So, Qualcomm has uh, been around about 30 years. Uh, we're, uh, we started, we're the one who started CDMA. It's a different way of encoding technology, encoding bits over the air. And basically that revo revolutionized the whole industry. So we have, uh, we created the mobile industry pretty much. Uh, and uh, now we're moving from that part of connecting people into connecting people to everything. And that's part of the, uh, the talk I'm gonna give about, uh, give today. What, uh, what's interesting about Qualcomm, I joined Qualcomm 10 years ago, 2007, I moved from uh, Toronto, I used to be in Toronto doing graphics uh, for ATI, uh, and then I did a couple of startups. What was interesting for Qualcomm at first for me is the, the scope and the, <clears throat> the volume of things we do. So just to give you an idea, in 2016, we shipped uh, close to 850 million chips uh, across our, our product portfolio. Some of the products, uh, over their lifetime have attained close to 800 million units shipped. So you, so you can imagine uh, the extent of challenge we have, uh, both from uh, the development side, the design side, specifying the right thing, because you, know, you have to have the right uh, product specified so that people buy it you know, in those quantities, but also everything that comes with it from, uh, uh, from the metrics we track. We, we have something we call a PPA, it's power performance and area metrics. And, uh, and then any inefficiencies in the design, let's say you know, if we were gonna turn that into cost function, uh, let's say you have a 10, 50, 80 cents or a dollar kind of inefficiency, 800 million units shipped, it's 800 million dollars that's down the drain pretty much. So the team is very much focused on, uh, uh, first of all, putting these chips out. We have capacity, we, we, we tape out about uh, uh, 30 million, uh, 30, 30 chips, 30 new products every year. 
Uh, and by the way, if you have an issue with the nomenclature, I use lots of acronyms, just uh, stop me and ask. Uh, uh, my team does the large, uh, large chips. So the, the last one we taped out, it was a week ago, uh, is close to uh, more than 6 billion transistors. So you can imagine uh, the amount of effort that goes into that. Um, the team is very global, so I have locations in, uh, in Canada, in the US, Middle East, Europe, Asia. And uh, we deal with uh, all kinds of uh, aspects of the, the particular product. So we start from uh, discussion with the foundries. My team develops all kinds of standard cells, memories, surdies, uh, all the way to specification of the product, to architecture, to post-silicon validation, and eventually commercialization. So it's, it's a large operation. Uh, Qualcomm is about, right now, before any acquisition or any merger, we're about 32,000 people. Uh, about uh, 18,000 of them in San Diego and the U.S., and the, the rest is uh, worldwide. Uh, so what else? We, uh, Yervant is our, our, uh, <laughs> one of our uh, favorite uh, suppliers, so that's why I can say no to him, so he drags me everywhere. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we were in Dallas. <laughs> uh, but again, I'm, uh, this has been a very nice surprise for me, being in Yerevan. Uh, I was, this is my second time, I was here last year, and uh, I realized the amount, of, uh, the amount of IP, the amount of products, the amount of uh, engineering that's coming out of uh, you know, this side, particularly from Synopsys, and uh, I, was, I was very pleasantly surprised. So you guys are doing a great work, and hopefully you continue this, and my first exposure to, uh, to the university here, hopefully there will be many more. So let's, let's wait for the... Real stuff now. Yeah. I can tap dance for so long. So. <laughs> All right, okay. Do you guys have a clicker? Oh. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, like I said, Qualcomm uh, basically came up or revolutionized the. the the whole mobile industry, the, the, the cell phones, uh, as, you know, most of you are fairly young, but some of us still remember you know, the large bricks and eventually the, you know, the flip phones and so on and so forth, eventually to, uh, to these days where we have the smartphones, right? And the smartphone, uh, the whole generation that, that came with it and everything that's associated with it. I mean, things are accelerating and the rate of change is accelerating at that rate of change is a double exponential for you guys who are interested in this type of thing. And the last one, uh, the last major uh, driver, it's been uh, the automobile industry. It's, uh, first of all, because they have lots of money, they can drive things, right? So they're spending lots of money and then uh, they're offering something new to, to for everyone, right? And the, the uh, the major, major impact is going to be how these experiences are going to change from you know, being connected in isolation, you know, you're with your cell phone, to being in environments where your whole uh, ecosystem, your personal ecosystem moves with you, right? So, so let's, uh, let's go through this. <clears throat> okay. So what I'm going to talk about today, again, if you have questions or you want clarification, please ask. What I'm going to talk about today, what the automotive industry wants from a company like Qualcomm, what type of devices they want, what type of systems they want, and, uh, and then take that and kind of translate that and, or put it in context of how it's, uh, how it's shaping the way we look at things as design engineers, as semiconductor professionals. So if you look at... Uh, I mean, the most obvious thing at the top is really self-driving cars. So people are completely fascinated by, by that concept. Uh, and uh, honestly, I think it's uh, once we're there, I mean, probably we need a decade or two. Uh, I mean, complete immersion, complete self-driving, it's going to be a major change. Think about it. How much time do you spend in your car and, uh, per day? First of all, from your time perspective, but also how much that particular appliance is costing you, right? You spend probably two or three hours in a car, depending on traffic, how far you drive, and that time in the car, usually the best you can do is, uh, well, some people text and do other things, but you shouldn't. But uh, 
Yeah, the best you can do is maybe listen to some audiobooks or uh, listen to music and things like that. So it's, it's a completely wasted productivity uh, as far as our personal time is concerned. But also from the, the cost of that appliance, again, if you look at the whole 24 hours, you probably, that thing is being used for 4 to 6% of the whole time. And it's, it's, it's a complete waste. So this is going to revolutionize uh, basically the way we become more productive. Uh, imagine you're in, the living, in your living room and your living room is being transported to, to that you know, appliance that's moving and taking you places. So that's, that's the one obvious thing. And it's driving, by the way, lots of technologies from, uh, you know, from, from all the machine learning, all the AI, all the obstacle recognition, diagnostics, self-repair, uh, collision avoidance, and things like that. The, the next one is connectivity. And uh, this is particularly very, very valuable for us because it's, uh, uh, at the core, Qualcomm is, is a telecom company, is a modem company, and uh, this is where actually our core competency is. And now we're seeing with all these devices connected together, we're seeing all kinds of uh, modems from uh, all the way to the different Gs, whether two, three, four, or five, to things like uh, Bluetooth, things like thin modems, uh, things like, uh, uh, like wireless LAN, and so on and so forth. The, the other one is, I already talked about it a bit, it's really you're taking your whole space at home, the stuff you're used to, where uh, you, know, you have your music, you have your reading material, you have your uh, videos and everything else that comes with it. You're taking it in that space, which is, again, an appliance that's, that's moving and taking you places. And uh, the last one there is efficiency. Uh, it's very expensive to, to run that infrastructure, whether it's the infrastructure of the highways, whether it's the infrastructure of the whole transportation system. It's very expensive, I, as I mentioned, to, to run the cars from you know, maintenance to fuel efficiencies to just general cost of having that, uh, that type of expensive equipment. And uh, because of all the smarts that are being put in these cars, we, uh, we started kind of exposing all the inefficiencies, whether it's you know, your driving habits, you know, how, how fast you accelerate, then you stop suddenly. We had that experience in the last few days. Our driver was very special. To, uh, to everything from proper climate control within the car, matching the environment. Uh, there are electrical engineers in, the, you know, in this audience. You know, people always talk about impedance matching. So there's lots of areas where you want to match the car to the environment, to you know, how traffic is flowing, how, uh, you know, how closely you're following the, the, the car in front of you, how closely the car behind you is following. Just to give you an idea, even to, in today's technology, there's about 300 microprocessor type chips or microcontrollers in a given car. And I'm not talking about the really expensive ones. I'm talking about uh, just uh, you know, the, a car that, you know, average price car you buy. And there's a cost to it. And you know, we're trying to bank on all of it. So I'm going to talk a bit more in detail about all of this. <clears throat> OK, so uh, by the way, we try to completely this is not an Audi or a Volkswagen or it's just, the, just a generic car, right? No, uh, no brand here. So what we're trying to do is basically the first paradigm is, is very, very important. I mean, today, as users of smartphones and mobile devices, we connect to people, right? You know, we connect either for voice calls or we connect to people through social media. Now, uh, with this change in paradigm with, uh, you know, people, I'm sure you guys heard of Internet of Everything or Internet of Things, the IoT stuff. Uh, you guys heard about the cloud. You guys heard about all the machine learning that's going on. So everything is becoming connected to everything else. So the cars, and I'm going to talk about that, the cars would become connected to multiple different things, either stationary objects, people, or other moving objects. So, Again, this is creating a whole bunch of challenge for you know, how to manage this very complex system that's trying to make uh, decisions, you know, split kind of split millisecond type of decisions. In-car experience, uh, in -car experience, transforming that, I mentioned this, basically you'll end up with you know, what you're used to at your house or at your favorite workplace or if you're at a resort. So you'll have all of these uh, Everything that you're familiar with that you're used to is, is available with you, you know, in your car. And then uh, eventually all of it is going to lead to, uh, to autonomous driving. Uh, there are countries where they're actually forcing their auto industry to 
remove all kinds of uh, human interaction and vehicles driven by people within a decade. So Norway, by 2025, they want to eliminate all cars, all traditional cars. So everything would be, uh, everything would be autonomous, right? You, will, you won't have any, any control as a passenger in that particular device. So it's going to be controlled by AI, controlled by software, controlled by whatever is available in the cloud. And uh, you know, to some of us, it's probably a bit scary. On this side, you, know, you see, uh, <clears throat> this is the technology that it's going to make everything uh, happen seamlessly. So Qualcomm has been uh, developing all these Gs. Uh, you know, G is a generation of, of uh, particular telecom spec. So we started from 2G. I mean, there was always the 1G, but you know, no one really talks about that. Those were really the voice call days, the, the very early days. But we started with you know, 2G, 3G, and the latest 4G, where you see you get uh, <clears throat> there's much more experience than uh, what we traditionally used to for a wired connected device, right? I mean, if you had to connect your device to the internet, uh, basically through a wire, today we have the same experience on, uh, uh, you know, on our mobile devices. So it's very high speed internet. It's almost always available. And uh, you can do lots of different things with that type of a paradigm. If you think from this whole compute area perspective and what, what's enabling this technology, if you follow what happened in the last uh, maybe two and a half, three decades, it started with the, the microprocessor, right? Intel started it, then you know, you know, IBM with PowerPC, then eventually different companies. So, so the processing became very, very fast and very, very mature. Then eventually the memory, the memory itself, the memory, uh, speeds and technology caught up to it. So then we had fast memory and then very fast uh, CPU. So you can do lots of processing, but it was very localized because there wasn't any connection or connectivity available. So then the telecom area and then all these high speed links and high speed interfaces came about. So then you were able to have very high, high performance, high speed processing, and then you had multiple of these connected to each other that you can uh, uh, you can think about you know, parts of a different brain and then connected and then uh, uh, partnering to do, to do some complex computations. So this has been really what's, what's been driving all these different generations. And then for 5G, the interesting part about 5G is that there's no clear definition yet. Everyone is trying to have their own definition based on their product roadmaps and what they're trying to bring to the market. But uh, one simple way of thinking about this is that uh, I don't know if uh, some of you have experienced gigabit speed at Ethernet, where uh, you know, your, your upload and downlinks are close to uh, gigabits per second, really fast. So 5G is uh, basically you will have that on your phone or on your mobile platform. So you have at least uh, you know, gigabits per second downloading and uploading uh, uh, speeds, which basically means that you can upload and download very large files. There's a hidden message that I gotta speak faster. Um, so, uh, so basically, uh, okay. All right. Basically, it means that uh, first of all, there's very high speed links. Secondly, the latency. Imagine this: if 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 two cars are going very fast on a freeway, and there's some decisions to be taken from an algorithm or from an AI type of uh, entity in the cars you can't wait for that decision to, to be delayed. You the decision has to be very, very quickly and happened uh, almost instantaneously. And some of the metrics that are feeding or data that are feeding into this decision are in the cloud. They're not in the car, they're not in the device. So there's always have to be this communication to, to the cloud where either the, the car is trying to fetch some data or trying to get some uh, machine learning algorithm and then you need the response back very quickly so that you know, it could be a decision of, you know, to slow down, it could be a decision to move lanes, it could be a decision to avoid some obstacle. So think about 5G enabling all of that. Uh, another view of uh, 5G is imagine these large events, a stadium when there's, uh, where there's a concert, where there's a sport event. You have uh, 70, 80, 100,000 people there. And all they're trying to do is they're trying to capture the moment and share it with their you know, friends and families. And the problem is with very large kind of crowds like that, you know, there's, uh, there's problems with the signals, there's problems with uh, 
you know, the, just the network gets very congested. So 5G pretty much, you know, is going to enable that type of an experience, user experience. Okay, so I talked about most of this. Uh, this these are some numbers. I mean, this is a very, very large numbers, right? And uh, uh, basically, you know, within the next uh, 20 or so years, uh, you see how much, uh, how much money this, this industry is going to generate. So it could be anything from, uh, you know, from buying the appliances themselves to just developing the whole ecosystem. And I'm going to talk about the ecosystem and what it means. It goes from, you know, any, any dev connected devices to smart cities and so on and so forth. And then the majority of, of uh, this cost is uh, going to go to really the infrastructure aspect of it. It's very, very expensive to build the cities that are smart, to build the highways that are smart, to build the, you know, power grid that is smart, to build everything that you see and we take it for uh, granted that that's very smart uh, and it's going to take lots of money. So this is uh, basically going to drive the whole thing. Uh, again, if you look at the top connecting, uh, with the high performance compute available, with high speed connectivity available, it's, it's opening all kinds of new, uh, new possibilities for these connected devices. So things that uh, people didn't think about before, and I'll talk about that, suddenly it's becoming a, a possibility. New services, uh, I don't know, some of it, uh, I'm not going to talk about you know, augmented reality or virtual reality, but think of it this way, you're, you're on a vacation somewhere, you, you take your phone, you hold it up, you have uh, the GPS, obviously the phone knows the GPS location, and what you do is you scan wherever you are, and what happens is that your friends or from your social network would have let's left some clues uh, for, for that particular geolocation. And then you can actually see it live. You can communicate with your friends. Basically, someone might say, oh, go, go eat at this particular restaurant or drink at this bar or this, uh, you know, there's a very interesting vista, you know, not far from here. So, you know, that, that's, that's the augmented reality aspect. Uh, then, uh, so that's a new service. Then you have the whole virtual reality thing where you're immersed into completely something new. So all of these are enabled by, by this 5G uh, high-speed networks, low-latency networks. And, uh, and of course, new user, new user experiences. Uh, there's a famous, uh, well, not famous, but it's, it's something that's been circulating a lot. You, you have someone doing a mountain biking, a fairly high-speed, uh, and then he has his helmet, he has his GoPro, and while he's going down the path, uh, he's broadcasting his experience firsthand as a first person experience because the camera is capturing what he's doing and it's broadcasting it to, uh, to his parents in their, uh, wherever they are in their house, right? Uh, maybe far away, maybe across the globe. So these are the type of things that, that are becoming almost, uh, almost trivial. People are expecting that. Okay, this is an interesting, <clears throat> very interesting aspect uh, of what's happening, right? I mean, that 2.5 or 2.4 trillion I explained. The one thing interesting, if you look at the V2X, V2X, uh, V is for, stands for vehicle, and uh, two, I mean, it's just basic connectivity. It can be V2 another vehicle, so it could be V2V, it could be V2I, in, like IoT stuff, infrastructure. So let's, let's look at uh, the, the, the most basic one. Uh, up on top is the uh, vehicle to network. The network in this case is really the cloud. So uh, there's lots of very, very large petabytes of data sets that are going to stay in the cloud. And these things have all kinds of information about either location information, uh, information about a particular car, information about particular uh, type of interaction that might happen, you know, because uh, and I'll go talk about what type of cameras and sensors are in the car. So that's, that's very important, that your vehicle be able to connect to, uh, to, to the network and be constantly on. Because uh, think about this, for the newer uh, systems and the newer cars, you will not have, uh, you will not have the possibility to, to adjust course, right? The other one is really vehicle to pedestrian, where, uh, where re you know, you're trying to... Uh, monitor what's happening around you, people walking, and you want to make sure that you don't, you don't go you know, over someone. It's usually fatal, you know, fatalities you want to avoid. Vehicle to infrastructure, whether it's traffic lights, power grid, uh, uh, different, different type of uh, uh, 
smart city type of thing where, where you, you're trying to find parking, let's say, and your vehicle immediately will figure out where to park or where parkings are available. And then, uh, and then all of these things are basically demanding high performance type of, uh, uh, type of product. So that's why some of the products we're working on has you know, eight CPUs, eight large CPUs with you know, 3.5 gigahertz and above speeds. Uh, they have high speed links, they have graphics coprocessors, they have uh, network processing units just to do to process some of the artificial intelligence and machine learning aspects of it. So you know, we call them NPUs for uh, deep, uh, uh, deep neural networks and uh, all kinds of sensors and, and interfaces basically. Okay. Um, two years ago, we were, we were uh, trying to find a specification for, uh, for uh, what, what our next generation device is going to look like. And someone said, uh, you know, we have, in the chip, we have something called a display controller. Basically, what it does, it, it's, it projects or it controls the display of what goes on, you know, what, what's displayed basically on a flat screen or whatever surface you're trying to uh, uh, show the data. And they said, we need that, we need uh, 11 types of display to be controlled in a car. And, uh, and then we were wondering, because we're used to these type of things, right? You know, the, the display on the back seats where your, your kids or whoever sitting in the back are watching a movie. So we started counting. So first of all, this, this part, the whole instrumentation is gonna be electronic. So, I mean, it's gonna be digital. So you can change things, you can change the dial. So that's one display. Then you have the center console, that's two. Uh, where you have all your controls, whether it's climate control or anything else, or your map. Then you have uh, a display by the driver, uh, by uh, the passenger side, so that's three. Then you have uh, two of these, so that's five. And then you have to accommodate for the third row, so two more displays of this, so that's seven. So we're saying, okay, where's the, where's the other four are coming from? Then you have the two side mirrors, that's nine, right? So basically the side mirrors are completely turning into, uh, into camera-based uh, camera uh, displays, right? And then, uh, then you have the, the, the rear view mirror. So basically we're taking anything that's simple, that works, you know, things like very basic, like mirror, you know, 18th century technology, and turning it into something that's, you know, completely, uh, you know, blows your mind, it, it's everything digital. Not only it's digital, it's also, uh, because it's digital, there's gonna be all kinds of AI working on these, whether it's pattern recognition or uh, just processing of information and so that the car can take decisions on them, right? So, so these are things, by the way, if, if, you have, uh, if you have a chip that's driving 11 displays, so you need a larger CPU there, you need larger pipe for the memory subsystem, you need, uh, a larger GPU there, and you need all kinds of different processing so that you can accommodate for that, uh, uh, for that type of uh, request. Okay, this is another interesting one. Again, you gotta think about, yes. What, okay, uh, so the question is what we gain by replacing mirrors with, with cameras and with displays. Basically what happens is that, think about it this way, uh, eventually this is all driving or getting to a point where you will not have a driver in the car. So, so a rear view mirror won't, need, won't, meet, or won't, won't mean anything, right? Or side mirrors won't mean anything, right? So think about this, this is kind of a in between phase where we're getting ready for a completely autonomous car. Where in an autonomous car, you don't need a mirror, right? Because the car is doing take. You can you can have the display, but so it's it's a, it's kind of a an intermediate product to go there. Like if you look at some of the cars that are claiming they're autonomous, they still have drivers in there, so they still need all these cameras to capture. They they have the back cameras, the side cameras. And, uh, and then they're saying, because we we're gonna capture all of this information, we're gonna process it, we're gonna digitize it. For instance, think about it this way. You're driving at night, right? You're, uh, you have really difficulty on looking at the rear view mirror. I mean, they do kind of uh, optical uh, uh, 
shading or grading so that you can still see some, but imagine this, your camera turns into an infrared camera. So now you have full visibility, even in, if it's completely dark of what's going on around you, right? So things like that. So this is why uh, some of the high-end cars already have that, right? So it's all for you know, safety, collision detection, things like that. Uh, over time, you know, the, the, the need for mirrors is going to disappear, but the need for processing is still going to be there. It's just the fact that you're not going to be display anything else on, on a mirror, but it's, the processing is still there. Okay, okay another, uh, we're in a you know, kind of a cross-section within a city. So entering a lane, so this is some type of uh, decision making between two cars, right? What do you do if, uh, if you're proximity or a car, you've got to change lanes. So all of these communications have to happen. It's almost like the cars have to figure out who has the right of the way based on some algorithm. Uh, finding a charging station, like finding a parking space, all these decisions have to be made uh, without human interaction. Then you will have uh, things like updating maps uh, where you have, you know, something might change or you have a, we have an accident. So things change on the fly that uh, the algorithm would redirect traffic into, into different zones and different uh, streets if you would like. And pedestrians, I mean, that's, that's the most uh, critical one where you don't want your car suddenly start going over people, right? And it's very difficult. I mean, think about it. If, if you're driving today uh, and you come to a pedestrian crosswalk, right? What happens? There's almost like a, uh, an unofficial handshake that happens where, you know, they look at you, the, they see that the driver acknowledged them, and then they have the confidence to cross, right? How do you do that where there's no driver and then you still want these people to cross in a safe way? You have to have cameras looking at the facial kind of, uh, uh, facial kind of patterns and then acknowledgement, which, which are cues that are not obvious. So how about other things where you have a shadow and then the car doesn't know if it's a shadow or an obstacle, whether it can go over it or have to turn around it. I mean, these are some basic problems that uh, still uh, people have solutions to that, but it's not perfect. Uh, so, so these are the type of things that are driving you know, all these requirements from, from a processing perspective. Okay, this is, uh, this is something about where, uh, you know, how this, this industry is driving our requirements. I think I talked about, uh, uh, you know, most of them. I'm going to talk about accuracy a bit. Uh, today, we have GPSs that Probably, I mean, military grade, you probably pinpoint within you know, a few centimeters. Uh, the best ones, it depends whether you're on a GPS service or you're just triangulating between cell towers. So it can be, accuracy can be anywhere from you know, a few meters to uh, you know, tens of meters. Now, with the, with the 5G and millimeter wave, you can actually pinpoint someone's location at, uh, by you know, a granularity of a millimeter, right? So, these are the type of things that you will need when you're navigating to some uh, foreign terrain or you know, a new city or you just want the car to, to be very accurate. Because you can't, you can't have your, dri your car driving and then the uncertainty being you know, a meter here or there, right? You see that that's pretty much a disaster. So that's one thing. It's also a technology that we're, uh, we're working on. I talked about uh, you know, everything else and I'll talk about security in a, in a few slides. Okay, so that's, uh, those are the areas that you're going into policy issues, and it's, it's, it's a serious problem. I mean, who do you sue? Do you sue the, the software drive? Do you sue the car manufacturer? Do you sue the software that's being uploaded? Actually, there's, there's no, there was one interesting case in San Francisco. This was maybe six or nine months ago. A, po a policeman stopped a self-driving Google car, and yeah, people were, so the guy was trying to write a ticket, and then who do you drive the time? Because there was no driver. There's no steering wheel. I mean, I, I don't know if you... So eventually the, 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 the cop uh, wisened up and he didn't want to set any precedent. So he let the guy go. But, I mean, these are at the heart of policy. Insurers are very worried. Now Google is actually creating an insurance business because they, they know that traditional insurers are not going to be able to deal with this. So they're creating... Right, right. So these are some of the open policy questions, right? So, uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is a quick thing about uh, 
uh, about Qualcomm. So we were engaged with all the major uh, major auto drivers. We have uh, you know multiple design wins. What, what uh, I would draw your attention to these three words: telematics is all the connectivity. Infotainment is basically the stuff I showed, where you have a center console, you have the the your movies or your audio playing in the back. And then connectivity is all the other connectivity that's not a modem. So things like wireless LAN, things like Bluetooth. One, uh, one study showed that uh, a major cost of manufacturing a car is the wires in it. And not only they're expensive to manufacture, but also they're heavy. So that, in fact, hits your efficiency. So what these car makers are trying to do is everything that's connected by wires today, change them into wireless. So everything in your car would be connected by Bluetooth, let's say. Uh, so the car would become lighter. The connection has to be you know, much more robust and always on. So these are the areas that you know, people are uh, working on. OK, security. Quick thing on security. Uh, this is actually what goes in, in the chip itself, in the product itself. So if you look at the, the top right there, a key management and provisioning means that you know, I talked about we shipped 800 million chips. For each single one, there's an identification that's unique to that chip. It's almost like a DNA. And that happens at the, uh, when we're trying to push these devices into productization. Storage security is basically when you have on-chip memory or system memory, how protected that data is. So it could be your personal data. It could be information about where you're going. It could be information about just the general situation of the car or your location. So you, don't, you want all of that secure. Debug security is uh, usually when something fails and people are trying to uh, figure out what fails. And that's where usually hackers get into backdoors. And that's where we have most of our challenges. Hardware crypto is all these crypto engines that are usually published by government agencies. So basically, they make it very hard for people, almost impossible for people outside of the owners to, to look and see what's, what's in there. Uh, secure boot and trusted environment is when you turn your phone on or when you turn your chip on, you, you have to trust that that particular entity who's controlling your phone or controlling your car is actually a valid entity, right? It's not someone hacked in. So we spend lots of time in all of this. Actually, this goes back to your, it's part of a policy. What if someone hacked the car and drove it into a wall? Now, who's responsible, right? Could be the chip manufacturer, could be the car manufacturer, could be the software. Could we the network, the, the operator who's allowing that thing to happen, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex problem. OK, <clears throat> some other uh, enhanced driver assistance. Uh, basically, you know, we have some of the stuff today already. It's been around for a couple of decades, you know, the ABS, the brakes, right, the lane changing. Lately, the one that, you know, the self-parking and things like that. So that's, that's already been there. And it's been very kind of ubiquitous, where you know, people don't even think about it. Then you have the vehicle diagnostics, where you want to make sure that that car, because it's, uh, think about this, eventually it's going to be all uh, controlled autonomously. So, so you don't have a human interacting. Well, if you have a human, it's, it's probably like air traffic controller. They'll be sitting somewhere across town or across you know, the continent, and they're just looking at data, you know, points in a, on a radar screen. So you want to make sure that that particular car or particular vehicle is, is, uh, is acting, is, 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 uh, is in good shape. Uh, collision avoidance, I mean, it's obvious, right? Where these things are moving at freeway speeds, you want to make sure that there's no accidents and everyone is behaving or every vehicle is behaving the way they should be. Uh, Hands-free communication, we have it most of the time today, but it's going to be more than that. I mean, you will have your overhead. I forgot to mention the overhead display, right? I mean, besides all the displays, now you can have information or map, the, you know, turn-by-turn -turn map uh, projected on your wind, uh, windscreen, right? Uh, stolen vehicle. Uh, by the way, this is a funny one because imagine this, you know, decades from now, people will not own cars. I mean... I don't know if you, you guys heard of Uber, right? I mean, uh, you, you call a car or you call a service and a car would show up. So there's no ownership anywhere. But today, I mean, still people want to steal those things. But, uh, and then what else? And distracted driver alerts where, you know, the, this camera. It's not that today you have this lane changing warnings or if your car starts drifting from the lane, the, the car warns you. Uh, 
Now the, the high-end cars have cameras where they look at your facial expression. They look at if you're, you're sleepy or you're tired or, you know, there's all kinds of enhancements like that. Um, Pardon? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, I mean, that's another thing. Police officers might be some algorithms monitoring other algorithms, right? So uh, I'm going to stop here now. I don't know if you, you have some questions. This is the, the other stuff is about Qualcomm, and then I talked about this. Yes? Does your ecosystem consider that there might be cars that people will want to drive, so not start driving cars, or you do expect that those will be? No, for, okay, so uh, I mean, the, the, way, the way these things are going, like I said, a whole cities or countries are basically, they don't want any cars driven by humans. So if you want to drive a car, you go to these special places where there's a circuit, well, a Formula One circuit, and that's where you drive, right? It's ridiculous. I'm sorry, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's the reality you're going to wake up to. I'm going to retire by then, so. <laughs> I've driven my cars <laughs> for 50 years. Yeah. But don't think about it this way. I mean, if you're driving every day, you're, you, have a, you have a commute that's two hours, let's say, each way. In some cities, I mean, especially in North America or Asia, that's, that's not far-fetched. So people drive an hour and a half, two hours in the morning. I have colleagues in India who, who each way is about an hour and a half. So you're sitting in that thing for three hours. And what are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. Just nothing. You're doing nothing. So don't you rather take a car you own, because you, you still can own the cars, but, but there will be special editions, and go on a circuit and then go crazy on that versus you know, driving to work every day in and out. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to convince you one way or but it's, uh, or think about it this way. You know, I mean, I like driving, but I don't like driving when I have to drive. When I have to go to work, I'd rather sit in something and read a newspaper or just sleep or you know, anything, right? So, I mean, these are the type of experiences that are going to change and... Uh, but maybe when that time comes, then nobody will drive his uh, work. So, yeah, that too. Long. That too, yeah. That too. That too. But, uh, yes. Thanks for the presentation. And I have just a question regarding the cost of the technology. So, mm -hmm. uh, as we have seen, so a bunch of new uh, high-tech <coughs> stuff is going to be put into a car, uh, so they are staying the in and so a regular car, car uh -huh. car nowadays, it will have a bunch of new electronics in it. So how does it, how this is going to be reflected in the price of the vehicle itself? So, okay, good question. If you look at it uh, today, obviously they can't make these cars too expensive, too prohibited to people to, I mean, you know, the, the Tesla started this whole thing, right? And these were really high-end cars, and people who can afford them, bought them. And they were you know, usually not their first car. They were second or third car, right? They had a traditional car. Right after that, there's the next way of cars are coming in that are very affordable, right? So, so just because all this technology is there, they can't make it very expensive. And then the savings are going to come from other places. Uh, I, I talked about uh, you know, getting rid of wires. I talked about getting rid of all kinds of hydraulic systems. Uh, I talked about safety, because you know, part of the stuff that, that car makers spend is on infrastructure. Uh, so honestly, I think that the car prices, I look at you know, the cell phone prices, look at the chip prices. I mean, they're just going to keep on going down, but yet you're going to have all kinds of great technology in there. I mean, you guys heard about Moore's Law, right? You know, double every 18 months, twice the performance, half the price. And that trend, it's almost like, you know, this is going to be an extension of that where things are going to become much more powerful, much more sophisticated, yet the price keeps on going down. I mean, if companies sell 800 million to a billion chips a year, the price is going to be there, the pressure is going to be there to, to lower the prices. And then, the other thing is I talked about you know, 300 different components going into a car. Those are expensive. But imagine if, if you start aggregating and integrating more and more, right? You, know, you guys are working on 7 nanometer compared to what was you know, even maybe five years ago at 65 nanometer or 90 nanometer. You know, I'm talking about 6 billion transistors plus, 10 billion transistors on a chip. So 
then instead of 300, maybe you'll end up with 100 chips in the car. So that's where you know, the cost is going to come down. Much more sophistication, much more powerful uh, cars, yet the prices, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the beauty of you know, economics and uh, large scale, yes? We have it today, right? We have it today. I, I think, honestly, I think uh, that system is very dangerous. That system is going to fail. Because, I mean, I mean some of you everyone knows, in, in, uh, in San Francisco area, when they came up with these cars and Google was testing them. So you see all kinds of drivers on the freeway trying to kind of you know, cut on the cars, see how they're going to react. And, and uh, yeah, it's testing. Yeah, it's, it's part of testing. So honestly, for this type of complex system to, to work, you have to remove the one parameter that's the most unpredictable. And what's that? Humans, yeah, you got to remove them, right? <laughs> Not remove the human, remove them from driving a car. Now, you see, he doesn't like it, right? <laughs> yes. They're going to turn into programmers and algorithm developers. I don't know, honestly, I don't know. It's, it's shifting. Actually, Yeah. I, okay, let me, let, me, let me give you an example. I, I think you, know, you have a good point, but it's not just the drivers. I think uh, there's, you guys have heard of Watson, right? And someone was mentioning about uh, TA, you know, teaching assistant. The jobs, the Watson, the IBM uh, big machine, the big blue that, you know, the predecessor uh, kind of defeated uh, Kasparov at, test, at, at chess. The people at risk today, it's, it's very interesting, are medical doctors. Yeah, because for, for diagnostics, you have these machines that can diagnose better. Because imagine this, a doctor with the whole Google information, plus, plus you have, I mean, you guys, you guys watch Star Trek, right? I hope so, because you won't be in uh, science. But, you know, there's, there's all, these machines have all kinds of sensors that can detect uh, micro changes in your face. They can detect uh, in your skin color. They can see what's under that the typical doctor cannot see. So, so those guys are at risk. The other guys are at risk from losing their jobs is, is really lawyers and paralegals who do all kinds of searches on cases. There's so many sophisticated algorithms that can recognize legal text and then set precedents and so on and so forth. And it goes on and on. So yes, there are going to be lots of casualties because all of this uh, yeah, well, even, uh, even surgery, I mean, you, you've seen some of the movies, right? Uh, which movie was that? Prometheus? Mm -hmm. When they have these pods where they can do, you type the type of, uh, you punch in the type of surgery, and you just lie there, and then it's going to perform. Wow. So before we get to, uh, to worry about, you know, the, the billions and billions of drivers, you know, the, the, honestly, this whole thing, this whole thing is shifting the paradigm into, there's going to be lots of change about, so-called traditional uh, kind of careers that are not going to exist anymore, right? So, body, body shops also disappear. Body shops? Yeah, probably less and less, right? <laughs> or I, I, actually, it's going to be. I mean, these cars are going to be very affordable. That if if something happens, they get into an accident, there's damage. Have you just you just drop it and get a new one, right? Yes. Uh huh. Uh, who will take control? Okay. <laughs> Actually, it's uh, if you look at it, it's it's a distributed decision making, uh, and it's not going to be. Again, I mentioned if if a human is is part of that decision, it's probably some you know new way of traffic controller that's sitting somewhere remote and looking at data and looking at. For instance, one type of decision could be there's a congestion somewhere. You know. Some of you have taken fluid, uh, fluid dynamics, right? Remember how fluids flow into narrow, uh, narrow conduits and things like that, right? Same thing for traffic control. And those are algorithms that were, or uh, methods that were developed you know, decades ago. So people are applying the same thing. So someone can direct traffic into less congested areas. So that's one decision making. Then the decision making as far as the V2X I mentioned. So it's going to be within the vehicle itself that you're going to have you know, chips and uh, 
algorithms that are uh, you know, that are going to take that type of a decision. No, I don't need the slides. Thanks, everyone. So, and then so you have some chips in the car that are taking those decisions. I talked about these powerful devices. You know, for instance, in, in our latest product, we have eight processors, each running at 3.5 gigahertz. Eight of them. And then you have a graphics engine. Okay? So then you have a network processor that, that's good at deep machine learning or neural nets. Then you have a DSP, a digital signal processor, that runs multiple threads on it. So you have all these kind of devices or all these uh, IP within, within a given product that are trying to take a decision. And there's algorithms that run on a combination of these devices or a single one. So that's, that's another decision, uh, this is a decision center, right? Then you have you know, things like where, where you have a smart city and it's directing traffic or parking to where to charge. So it's really going to be very, very distributed and removing, you know, removing the person, the one sing I mean, people behind the wheel is they're the single points of failure, which is the worst situation to have. I mean, anything in a car fails because of that one thing that's behind the wheel. And then, you know, this paradigm is going to remove all of that. Now, whether you, tr <laughs> you should trust the software or not, that's a different thing. But, you know, these things, a, one Google study said that they had 8 billion hours of testing that went on for all these cars, for all these algorithms. Now, think about it this way. Some of these machines or some of these algorithms, and the simplest one, neural nets have been around for 30 years, nothing new. Neural nets, basically, you, you, need, you have a data set, which is a training set. The more you have, the better that you know, those nets become. So the more you train them, the, 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 the more sophisticated, the more precise they would come. So when you, get, when you buy a car, you know, the car won't say that this is how many horsepowers anymore. Or it's, it's, it won't say this is the fuel efficiency. It's going to say this neural net in this car has been trained for 10 billion hours or 20 billion hours or 100 billion hours. So things are going to change, right? I mean, but yeah, there's... You're not going to drive a car in 20 years. <laughs> Someone's going to drive you. And if you want to drive a car, really, you go to these special places where the racetracks. Well, I mean, why do you need a license for? I mean, you just need, the, you just need an app. Honestly, I mean, today, like, lots of places I go, I don't even bother renting a car. Because, first of all, it's too expensive, especially when I go back to Canada, winter time. You rent a car. You leave the car outside overnight in the morning, <laughs> you have to scrape it, right, because it's frozen. Where, you know, you have an app, Uber, where, you know, you download the, the app, you have your credit card information. You guys have heard of Uber, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, what? A <laughs> so, it's very convenient. Another situation, I was in, uh, a few months ago, I was in Taipei, right? So, I had an extra day. I said, okay, let me go to a museum. I was at the hotel, hopped into a cab, went to the museum. Ran to the wrong museum, but that's a <laughs> it was a very interesting. So after like an hour, I want to go back to the hotel, and then no one speaks English, and I don't speak Chinese, not, well, not yet. So then, uh, then she's pointing me to the street. So I go up. It's a, it's a main, uh, you know, large street, and there's cars zooming by, and there's cabs, but no one's stopping. So what I do, I called Uber. A guy shows up, nice car, speaks English, took me where I want. So. You know, at some point, yeah, you don't need a driver's license. You don't need, whether it's for weather convenience, just financially, economically, it just, things are going to change. For young people. Yes. Uh, you are talking uh, about the future where uh, everything will be uh, automated. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, wondering, you are, uh, investing in uh, automotive uh, in industry, and why you are sure that in the future they will begin to move from point A to point B? Or they do must become uh, now... Because, okay, look, look at, look at... Uh, work from home and we became... Uh, do it in yeah. <laughs> look, I mean, look, look back. Look at the... You can go back hundreds of years. Look at... What's driving every human invention? What is it driving? It's, it's 
cost. I mean, it's funny because as engineers we say, oh, cost, you know, no one cares. That's you know, something accountants do. It's really everything we do is financed by saving somewhere. Someone's making money. So that's driving. That's one thing, right? Second thing is what's driving? And the order might be you might choose one over the other. What's driving? Inefficiencies. Go back to the invention of the printer. That, that whole thing revolutionized, I mean, I mean, these are major, major paradigms. Why, why did people invent the printer? Because there was inefficiency. You can't write things fast enough. And then look at every invention, major inv industrial age, automation, Ford, right? Ford created this whole, you know, industrialized way of producing something that was, you know, piece, then piece, then piece, back, back to back to back. So everything is driven by squeezing efficiencies out. This is one of the least efficient infrastructures we have. This is one of the least efficient you know, appliances we have. Whether, whether you, again, how much you drive, it depends. But you know, on average, there's maybe 4 to 6% you drive during a day. And the rest of the time, that thing is parked doing nothing. So that's one issue. That, that's from an individual perspective. The whole infrastructure is so expensive to build these freeways. Then you have to maintain them. You have, you know, all kinds of things are happening. That's why, uh, you know, traffic, congestions, uh, fuel efficiencies, I mean, just pile it up. So those are the drivers that are going to make this happen. I mean, people are already investing heavily in, in this area. And we can't, we can't, push products fast enough to kind of hit all of these areas. And just one, it's, it's not just the infotainment. I mean, that's a simple thing. You want, you want entertainment in your car. It's just the whole you know, artificial intelligence aspect. It's the whole efficiencies. It's the whole, you know, having uh, you know, the, the algorithm drive your, 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 your car, right? Uh, so that's, that's why, I mean, People argue against these things. I mean, companies usually are smarter than people, but you know, you can argue. But mainly, things are driven by the economy of scale, driven by you know squeezing inefficiencies out. Why do you think we keep on chasing, you know, f uh, smaller and smaller transistor sizes? Because we can put more transistors in there. It's more efficient and it's cheaper, way cheaper. So it's it's coming. I mean, embrace it. It's a good thing, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, I have such a question. So uh, you were talking about the infrastructure, about the cost of uh, well, maintaining the roads, yeah, the highways, etc. <coughs> so uh, is the industry going uh, more to invest in uh, like air cars or hovering cars, mm -hmm. something that does not have to be dependent on the ground? Right, right. So we have, we have some... Uh, Okay, there's, there's, we have some people, actually one of our, uh, uh, our previous CEO, he was, he was the son of the founder, it's actually uh, when we were doing, we have this annual thing where we do uh, these ventures, we bring in these companies who think about the future, five years, ten years. He, 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 he basically said it's easier to solve the, the flying or hovering cars problem than solving cars driving around roads because of all the issues that we have. So, People are actually thinking about that. You know, Uber, you know, out of any, they have this this uh, this drone which can carry about three or four hundred pounds. Basically, you know, depends one or two person. Depends, you know, how much. Uh, maybe Yervant and I can fit in one. <laughs> but they are thinking about this now. There's there's other issues, of course. I mean, uh, this gentleman was asking about, you know, policy issues, privacy issues. But people are thinking about that. And honestly, in lots of these areas, the technology is there. If you look, I mean, if you look at what you're studying, what you're working on, uh, you know, these, the pieces are there. It's just a matter of someone finding a way to make the, the economy of it work. Someone finding that, you know, the policy of it's going to work, that, you know, they're not going to get sued. So, you know, all of these, uh, you know, one, of the, one of the messages there was that it's opening new, possibilities of different things happening, new user experiences. And the only thing holding us or these entrepreneurs now is really if there's legal issues or policy issues or maybe it's too expensive. But the technology is there today. And we have it here, our cell phones. Every technology, all these apps, 
all these uh, you know recognitions, all these sensors. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, my, my first reaction is, first of all, I, I think it's going to be safer. And that's, that's the, I mean, the, one of the numbers there was people, uh, people are worried when they're driving their cars. And if you look at some of the statistics, and I mean, it, it's true, you get more accident, more fatalities just by people getting into accidents driving cars than plane crashes. It's one of the, I mean, think about it this way, you know, there's multiple ways of looking what a car is. For us, because we sell chips, a car is, uh, you know, an IoT device, right? Where it's connecting to everything. Uh, in one extreme, I mean, so we've seen some of the classic movies, uh, the car can be a killing machine. And uh, unfortunately, what's going on, you know, lately in the world, you know, you see, you know, it's, it's a very dangerous, and forget about these extreme situations, but even going on a freeway, you know, getting in an accident, even if it's not, you know, completely fatal, you get injured, you get back problems, you get incapaci incapacitated. So for me, the most important thing is this thing is going to make that whole thing very safe. Now, as far as the investment is concerned, again, some people, uh, and this started probably 10, 15 years ago, people realized that there's money to be made and lots of money to be made. Because, uh, I mean, 20 years ago, you know, we, we started, we had this Nokia phones, cell phones, uh, no one thought about how much money it's going to take to invest in, in devices where I haven't talked about the whole IoT thing and connectivity thing, but people didn't think that oh, it's going to be very expensive to invest in infrastructure that's going to carry 4G traffic or 3G traffic. That thing costs like hundreds of billions and yet people spend the money because money is coming back, right? Through subscription models and things like that. Uh, same is going to be with the automotive side. People know they're going to take their money, and it's it's not it's not huge money for the consumers. The sharing economy. It's just you know imagine you get one car, and then that car is being used 23 hours a day, and then the one hour is for maintenance, right? 23 hours a day, you went from four to six percent efficiency into 96 percent efficiency. So that's what's driving this whole investment, right? And Again, it's sad, it's a reality, there's lots of people, and again, it's not just the drivers, but it's lots of people who have to be retrained into going to uh, you know, different careers. I mean, I, I just mentioned the, the, the medical doctors, uh, lawyers, things like that, right? It's just a reality. Anyth okay, now, when you go home, when you're in your car, <laughs> probably I ruined your driving experience now, think about every small decision that you're left side of the brain doesn't think about anymore. Because when you learn to drive, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago, like some of us, that part, you know, became part of who you are, right? And then everything moved to the right side of the brain, so you don't think about it anymore. You're not... So now, everything you do, every decision you make to go from point A to B, think about all of this are going to be taken over by algorithms, by devices, which can take much more efficient decisions, much faster decisions, and then you're going to benefit from them. Imagine you're driving, you're sitting in a two-hour, first of all, traffic is going to disappear because of all these controls, right? Uh, all this fluid mechanics management type of thing. But think about it. You're sitting in your car for a given period of time, but you're enjoying doing nothing, reading, listening to music, sleeping, whatever, whatever you, you, you're, you, know, you would like. And believe me, it's, it's, it's a good thing. And we're going to sell lots of chips, so. <laughs>